You might wonder how so common a wildflower as the daisy slipped through the net of our wildflower outings up to this. Especially because it is such a typical representative of one of the three great tribes in a family to which it gives its name, the daisy family. Well, in a sense, it didn't really slip through the net because very early on in season one, we looked at oxeye daisy, which is essentially similar to the common daisy in its floral biology, but was selected for prior treatment uh, ahead of the common daisy simply because the flowers are larger and it's much easier to see the detail of what's going on. All the same, uh, it doesn't seem right not to give the common daisy its own slot, particularly because it is such a beloved flower. And here in Burr we even have a creche named after it. Nonini Bioga. Nonin is the Irish word for a daisy, meaning little noon flower. So Nonini Bioga is small little noon flowers. But apart from all of that, the common daisy has a lot of distinctive, unique features all of its own. One of its distinctive features is the way it radiates outwards by vegetative spread from the point at which it first established itself. So it often occurs in circular patches, keeping its rosettes of leaves so close to the ground that they defy the closest of grazers and in any case their acidic sap makes them unpalatable for cattle. However, it can't compete when the vegetation grows to any height in the absence of grazing or mowing. Another distinctive feature is the way it tracks the sun over the course of the day. The daisy typifies the exceptionally successful floral blueprint that characterises its family, the daisy variant in particular and there is no more convenient species for reviewing it because the daisy is everywhere and can be admired at any time of the year, though seldom in such profusion as we see here. Technically speaking, the daisy is not a flower but an inflorescence, a highly organised aggregate of around 250 tiny florets functioning as a single unit of attraction. And the florets are of two kinds, bright yellow five-petaled hermaphrodite ones in a central disc surrounded by the strap-like white female-only florets, the disc florets developing centripetally from the outside in, so that it's in flower for a long time, and all enclosed in the tightly overlapping leafy bracts of the infoleucre behind the flower. The anthers in the disc florets have fused to form a hollow tube into which pollen is shed and from which it is then pushed up by the piston-like style and stigma, which keeps its two receptive surfaces together like a pair of praying hands as it does so. And only when all the pollen has been presented on top of the anther cylinder does the style extend to its full height and the stigma present its receptive surfaces to pollinators, of which there is a great range, flies and small beetles, moths, bees and butterflies. In the Irish herbal tradition which disappeared in the 17th century and which I will come back to talk about again later in the year, uh, daisy was a key ingredient in one of the most complicated prescriptions imaginable. And it's such a good example of the detailed practical botanical knowledge that these physicians were expected to have that I thought I would read it for you. Take daisy, violet, fresh maidenhair spleenwort, purslane, endive, prickly lettuce, roots of sorrel, wood sorrel, water betony, coltsfoot, plantain, flower of red rose and water lily, equal amounts of each, pound them and boil in pure spring water, strain well, put a little vinegar and juice of pomegranate into it, and sugar and licorice, the seventh part of these. Keep in a tin vessel and put the vessel in cold water to keep, and give it to drink to the patient as is necessary. This was for treating fevers of various sorts. And it goes on. Again, if you take daisies and boil them in a bath made from foliage of oak, then rub it on the hair and beard, this will change the grey colour. As well as this, Avicenna, who was one of the great classical authorities they regularly quoted, Avicenna says that if daisies are pounded 
and the water that lies in the hollow of a plat of cow dung is mixed with it, and this is put on warts, it will cure them. And also, if you mix the juice of daisies with the milk of a woman who has given birth to a daughter, and put one drop of this in the nostril, it will clear the brain. And so it goes on. The daisy closes firmly in the evening, or if rain threatens, by raising its white petals up to cover the central disc. It's sort of like drawing the blinds. And it won't waken up again until the sun is well up the next day. But here's an intriguing and rather wonderful detail. If you look at the tips of the white petals at the back. These crimson tips at the back of the strap petals on many daisies are due to the presence of the pigment anthocyanin. It's obviously not for attracting insects because they're behind the flower out of sight and you only notice them when the flower closes. But when the sun rises in the morning the anthocyanin converts the radiant light energy of the sun's light to heat, warming and waking up the flower. It's the daisy equivalent of yawning. <laughs>